Hello everybody and welcome to the Said Business School and welcome to the programme that we've called Art at Said. This is the second in the lecture series that we've got here and I'm so um, proud to welcome Michael Bird, who's an author and art historian on the St Ives Artists and author of this book, The St Ives Artist, A Biography of Place and Time, which has just been re reprinted again, second edition. And um, we, you may have noticed in the corridors, we have a capital exhibition of works by some of the leading St Ives artists, Sandra Blow, and we've got Brian Winter, who, both of whom you've written on, the uh, monographs. And who will feature tonight. Who yes. will feature tonight. Uh, Wilhelmina Barnes-Graham, yep. Alexander McKenzie. Exactly. Um, Quite a crowd. Absolutely. Yes. So this is why we brought Michael Bird to speak to us tonight. We're delighted that you're here and very much look forward to hearing about the St Ives artist. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Lizzie. Okay. Thank you. Um, very good to be here in Oxford, as far away from the sea as you can get, practically. So I will bring a little bit of ocean sound and rhythm into the room this evening. Um, I call this talk, Destination St Ives, How Modern Art Went West, um, because one of the most remarkable things about this little place in the far west of Cornwall, St Ives. Hands up who's been to St Ives. Okay, that's a good sign. I'm just going to take another quick survey. Um, I'm quite used to giving talks in museums and art galleries where there's work by these artists on the walls, as there is indeed here this evening, and I hope you'll take a chance to have a look at it. But Maybe not all of you have heard of Peter Lanyon, for example. Hands up if the name Peter Lanyon means something to you. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I feel on sort of fairly familiar ground here. I don't want to take too much for granted, is the point I'm making here. One of the most remarkable things about St Hives is that if you plotted lines on a map of the world of all the artistic journeys that had converged in St Hives, Artists and craftspeople coming from America, from Japan, from Canada, from all over the world, as well as London and Birmingham and Edinburgh, converging on St Ives. You would not find another point in the British Isles, apart from London, where you had so many lines, so many artistic trajectories converging on one place. And I think that's really remarkable. And that is the theme of the talk tonight. There are many different ways you could cut this cake, but that's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. And what I'm going to do is introduce artists. Um, we'll meet a succession of artists, and I'll introduce them one by one and talk a bit about their work and what brought them to Cornwall, but also where they came from. So this is very much it's a story about a little place, a fishing village, a tourist haunt. Um, it doesn't have, I mean, we think of Oxford, St Ives is almost the opposite to Oxford. It has no institutional culture. It, it, has, it has no um, fame as a centre of ideas, but it is, has been an extraordinary magnet for modern art. Again, not only artists who wanted to paint the horizon and the landscape and so on, but progressive, experimental, international modern artists. So just a little taster of the different artists you associate with St Ives. Well, Alfred Wallace, Alfred Wallace, quintessential St Ives artist, a, a, a sailor, a rag and bone man, turned painter in his 70s. Um, this is, I'm just going to go through a, you know, a, a series of images here. So this is St Ives Harbour by Alfred Wallace, painted probably in the late 1920s, early 1930s. Very recognisable landmarks, but not as you would see them if you went there and photographed them. Very much as you might see them in a dream, a sort of flying dream where you're flying over the harbour and the sea. This is a very similar landscape, similar terrain, painted by Peter Lanyon in the 1960s, end of the 1960s, after he'd started going up in a glider. So he's looking down at the sea and the coast from a glider circling in a thermal and looking probably at this area that was painted by Alfred Wallace, but how very, very different. And here's Barbara Hepworth. Um, so this is a, a, a drawing by Barbara Hepworth titled Porthmere. Um, 
If you travel round to the left of Alfred Wallace's painting, left of the harbour, round the headland, you'll get to Porthmere Beach. So it's not that far away, but again, how very, very different. And these are just three artists who, who, who lived and worked very, very close to each other, and yet whose sense of the place was, you know, couldn't have been more different in some ways, and yet you're already probably seeing similarities and seeing <coughs> colours and shapes that rhyme in these paintings. So, why did I write this book? Well, I, I was working on this maybe 10 or 12 years ago, doing the research, and it came out of reading a lot of books that came out of that time about the post-war era. Um, there was Peter Hennessy's Having It So Good. Dominic Sandbrook, Never Had It So Good. All about the Macmillan era, the, the Clement Attlee era, what happened in Britain the 20 years or so after the Second World War. Um, there was David Kynaston's fantastic Austerity Britain. And I became very, very fascinated by this period in history. Um, I suppose it's the time of my own parents' youth, that time which Proust says is always just out of touch. You know, it's part of your life, yet you never lived through it. Um, and all these books, fantastic information and detail, but they were all about cultural phenomena like, uh, you know, television and skiffle and Kingsley Amis, Lucky Jim. I think in, in about 2,000 pages, Barbara Hepworth, taking those three books together, Barbara Hepworth was mentioned about twice, <coughs> once as a member of CND, who went on the Aldermaston March, I think, and maybe once as an artist. Henry Moore, a handful of times. And I thought, in fact, what was one of the big things that was happening in Britain after the Second World War? It was that Britain began to get a sense of itself as a centre of modern art. This had never really happened before. And the Arts Council and the British Council and the BBC were putting out all kinds of, of modern art, contemporary art. There was this, this, this feeling, um, you know, as, as I think it was Maynard Keynes, his phrase, you know, we want to provide the, the best for the most, that sort of uh, the, and, and, and the sort of Rethian spirit of broadcasting. You wanted to communicate contemporary culture to a big mass audience. And so this was a really remarkable moment for the arts, which did not seem to have been, become part of the historiography of that time. Well, St Ives plays it, its part in, in that moment. Um, but we need to take the story back, 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 back to the end of the 19th century when the first wave of art colonists washed up in Cornwall. And they were people like Julius Olson here, who had come from London, was a, a celebrated marine artist, and set up a studio, a teaching studio, in one of these, these great studios in St Ives, uh, which were on Porthmere Beach. Porthmere Beach, we've just seen the Barbara Hepworth picture of Porthmere Beach where uh, a, a local entrepreneur, we're in the business school, this was a great business idea uh, by a local entrepreneur in St Ives in the 18, late 1880s, early 1890s. Um, fishermen were working on the ground floor, mending their nets, uh, sorting out their crab pots, but all these artists were coming down wanting to paint the landscape, and he thought, I'll build some studios. And the studios are still there and thriving, so, you know, what a fantastic idea that was. Artists came down to St Ives because they they'd spent time in French art colonies in places like Concarneau and Pont-Avant, and they developed this way of working where they, they painted the absolutely unspoiled, innocent lives of the local population. You know, I mean, the local population had a very different view of uh, the way the artists saw them, but here we have Julius Olsen looking out of his, his window across the horizon at Portmere Beach, an art colonist, but very much looking like the typical British middle-class colonist, uh, you know, abroad. I mean, this could be, a, you know, a South Sea island or, or somewhere. Um, a a fa fantastic shot there. And here's the kind of painting that Olsen was painting. Moonlit um, landscapes of St Ives Bay. And there we have the light. You can just see the light uh, of Goodrevy Lighthouse, which features in that Alfred Wallace painting. So Olsen busy producing this kind of thing at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, very, very popular with audiences in, and buyers in London at the Royal Academy, um, in the great industrial cities, people were buying this sort of thing. It was, this was why 
landscape was so popular because, you know, more and more people were living in cities and, and loved to dream about a world where industrialization had, you know, you could forget the Industrial Revolution had ever happened, you look at that painting. Well, this is Walter Sickert. Now, Walter Sickert, well represented in the Ashmolean. If you're interested in Sickert, they've got a fantastic collection there. I was looking at it this morning. Sickert, um, so here's, here's one of the first artistic journeys coming down to St. Ives. Sickert was the assistant of James McNeil Whistler, who had just been out in Venice painting beautiful nocturnes, uh, very much in touch with the, the kind of painting that was being done on the continent in Paris. Um, and Sickert was down in St. Ives in the winter of 1883 as Whistler's assistant. And he painted this as Porthmere Beach again, a very, very different view of, of that same patch of sand and sea. And this must be a local family because they were down there January, February, so there would have been no tourists. Um, and there they are, out, out in the sun, and Sickert painted that on a cigar box lid. Um, he was a London artist, quintessentially a London artist, Camden Town, you know, grimy streets, um, dreary interiors. And he, but he painted this for his housekeeper who used to tease him by dipping his brushes in mud because that, you know, those were the only colours he seemed to be able to use. And that was to show her that, you know, in a different place he could paint using very different colours. So here we have one of those great themes of, of, of St. Ives as a centre for art is the, is the light and the colour that, that try as you may, you can't help but find when you come down there. But no one, no one, no one at this, at this date, um, late 19th century, early 20th century, would have, would have mentioned the word St. Ives and, and, you know, modern art in the same sentence. The place where everyone wanted to be, all the artists wanted to be, uh, the place where things are really happening, of course, was Paris. And here is another artist I'm going to introduce you to, Winifred Nicholson. Winifred Nicholson... Um, had, uh, was, was a young artist, uh, was spending, spending time in Paris. This is uh, in the, she had an apartment on the Quai d'Ote, I think, and this is the view from her apartment window. Um, very Parisian street scene. This is mid-1920s. So she's just typical of the young British artists who are, who are going to Paris because that's where, that's where the exciting things are happening and the, and the new way of looking at the world seems to be taking shape. But Winifred Nicholson um, was part of a group of artists in this country, uh, which included her husband, Ben, and another young artist, Christopher Wood, um, who were all kind of got together and decided that they were going to refresh British art. So instead of painting in, in muddy, sickert-type colours or painting um, serious, sonorous um, views of the landscape like Julius Olson, they were going to go back to basics. They were going to, they were going to go for simplicity and, uh, and joy and colour, like early Renaissance Italian art. Um, and in the summer of 1928, this group of artists, who were really metropolitan people, Winifred and Ben Nicholson, um, had, had you know, been spending some time in Italy, uh, Winifred Nicholson, um, her family had a, a house on Hadrian's Wall in, in Cumbria where they spent a lot of time and also in London. Um, and a friend of theirs in London had a, a Cornish bolt hole uh, on the River Fowl. And this is where they came for a holiday in August 1928. And this is where Winifred painted this little boat on the river, bringing all that, all that kind of Parisian enthusiasm for colour and simplicity into the, the Cornish landscape. And here's one of the, the classic stories of St Ives, okay, another, another trip, another piece of travel. Um, during that holiday, Christopher Kipwood and Ben Nicholson made a trip over to St Ives where Kipwood had previously stayed. He was mainly based in Paris, uh, again of, of young, very international artist, um, you know, he knew Picasso, he worked for Jean Cocteau designing stage sets, extremely well connected, but he had spent a holiday in St. Ives and he must have said, well, come over, I want to show you this place. And, well, they were walking off Porthmere Beach again 
they passed the cottage where uh, this old chap lived, Alfred Wallace, and looked in through the window, half door, the half-open door, one of those sort of barn door type doors that the top opens, and saw the interior of this tiny little room full of pictures. And Ben Nicholson remembered that um, all these pictures were just nailed to the wall. And he said the smallest paintings seem to have the biggest nails through them. <laughs> and Wallace had, um, there he is, Alfred Wallace, um, photographed by Ben Nicholson. And Wallace had, uh, as I say, taken up painting after his wife died. He was in his 70s. And he, he went down to the, you know, the local grocer, supplied him with Quaker Oats packets and things like that. And he, he liked to buy yacht paint and boat paint. And he said, he said when he was asked, he said, well, I use real paint, not like the paint artists use, um, which I think says a lot about Alfred Wallace. And here I often include this slide because I think this is one of the, another view, another view of one of the great meetings in modern British art, which is Christopher Wood and Ben Nicholson. This is by Peter Lanyon's son, Andrew. And it is, um, it's often said that Kit Wood and Ben Nicholson discovered Alfred Wallace. You will often hear this said, you know, they came down to St. Ives and they discovered him. Well, this isn't this very colonial, you know, here they are coming as though he hadn't existed before they saw him. But here we have the, the other side, the other view of that, which is Alfred Wallace observing Christopher Wood and Ben Nicholson half an hour before their discovery of him. Uh, I think that's a, a, that, that's a very um, extremely sort of witty and succinct take on the colonial mentality. And here's a painting by Alfred Wallace of, of another international moment. This is the steamship Alba, which was wrecked off Porthmere Beach again in uh, January 1938. And um, the Alba was a, a Genoese registered ship carrying coal from Wales to Italy, to Mussolini's factories in January 1938. Um, I made a radio programme about this episode and spoke to people, all of whom have since died, who remembered Wallace and remembered the night the Alba was wrecked. And one of them told me that there was a ship full of scrap iron sent from Hale, which is the next port along from St. Ives, a ship full of scrap iron sent from Hale to Germany in August 1939. So the trade was going on, and I think, I think there are big international currents converging in this, in this wreck that Wallace painted. Um, and and he, as a, as a, as a, he, as a young boy, as a, as a cabin boy, had probably been to Newfoundland, uh, and that's another interesting thing about St. Ives is that people, people who grew up in St. Ives or who, who, you know, who'd spent most of their lives there, they might go to Newfoundland, uh, they might go to Brittany on, on the, on the uh, you know, fishing, but they would never go 10 miles to Penzance. You know, there was always this extreme insularity coupled with, with uh, a out, real outward looking kind of aspect. And here's what Christopher Wood made of Alfred Wallace. So here's a young artist who's trained in Paris, uh, his head's full of, of the new ideas in Paris. Uh, he started painting in a surrealist manner shortly after this. But here's that you can see the influence that Wallace's kind of manner of painting had on Christopher Wood. Uh, and this may even be Wallace uh, stomping down the coast path and again with Portmere Beach in the distance. So we're in the, this is, this is 1928, end of 1928, so we're in the 1920s here. I'm going to introduce you to another character in this story. This is Bernard Leach. Bernard Leach, who had trained as a potter in Japan. Um, in the Ashmolean, there's a lovely reconstruction of a Japanese tea room. Uh, and I was looking at that this morning and imagining Bernard Leach, this kind of six foot something, very, very English chap who... Uh, attended these tea ceremonies uh, and actually had to have a well made in the floor of the tea room so that he could get his long legs into it because he couldn't sit sort of cross-legged in the Japanese way. Um, but he learned from folk craft potters in Japan and he, he absorbed, very much absorbed, this idea that, that the, the pot, as in the tea ceremony, really you appreciate all the, the imperfections and the and the way in which the glaze runs or the, or, you know, and so on. And, and he brought back this very mystical view of, of pottery to, I mean, you know, for, for Leach, um, 
a, a pot was never just something that you put flowers in or you made a rice pudding in or something like that. It was those things too. He always said he would rather have um, a housewife. I mean, this sort of dates him a bit, doesn't it? A housewife use his pot for making a stew than have it sit in a museum. So that's very much Leach's attitude. But he set up in St Ives, uh, he answered an advert for a potter. And, and decided that he, he was going to be the man who set up a pottery in St Ives in 1920 in the most ridiculous place you could think of to start a, a commercial pottery. There was no wood for miles around to fire the kiln. Um, there weren't really any good local sources of clay, and if he wanted to sell his pots, he had to send them to London. But he was determined to do this, and, and, and he did. And the leech pottery in St Ives... Um, became again one of these international centres. People came from all over the world to learn from Bernard Leach because of, of this vision of his. And I can almost see the sort of little bubbles, you know, the speech bubbles in this photo. I mean, this is taken a bit later. This would be in, in maybe the 40s, I think. But there is Leach, very much the, the mystical mentor. And he's saying something. He's probably saying something like, this is how you attach the... The, the handle to the jug, but you imagine him also saying, well, you know, this is not just, a, this is so much more than a jug, this is a, a meeting of East and West I'm holding here. And that was very much the, the message that he put across, that a simple pot could be a, a meeting point of East and West. So another, again, a big sense of, of trajectory, of, of long-distance contact. Here we have... Uh, another enterprise from St Ives in the 1920s. Um, so not only have you artists coming down here and, and working and making contact with each other, but you also have, you also have businesses starting up. Um, this is a, a silk square uh, designed by a firm called Cresta Silks, which um, had existed previously in St Ives as Crusade and had been set up by an entrepreneur from Leeds called Tom Heron. Um, with designs, the designs were, were, were done, not this one, but by a, a man called Alec Walker who had trained with Raoul Dufy in Paris. And they decided to bring their silk, their, their art silk printing business down to St Ives. Um, and Tom Heron's son, Patrick, was a very precocious artist. And at the age of 14, Patrick Heron designed this silk square for the uh, Tom Heron's successor business, which is called Cresta Silks, which was the kind of L.K. Bennett of its day, really. They started up um, beautifully designed shops in, in high streets uh, all, over, all over England in the 30s. They were, they were one of the first examples of high street chic. So, again, you've got, you've got big ideas, international contacts, um, you know, all converging in this little place. The, um, the, crusade, the Crusade silk printing works was, guess where, at the other end of Porthmere Beach, um, from, uh, you know, not far from where we saw the, the, the wreck of the Alba on the right-hand side, if you imagine that, that picture. But, okay, late 1920s, we've had Christopher Wood, Ben Nicholson, Winifred Nicholson, sort of turning up in St. Ives, spending a bit of time there. Um, We've had Bernard Leach setting up his pottery, the Crusade silk printing works, but really there's no big momentum. It's, it's small enterprises happening. Um, you still wouldn't feel, you, no one would have said that St Ives was a centre of modern art, international modern art. That would have sounded ridiculous, even still in, in 19, 1928, 29, moving into the 30s. So back to London. This is Hampstead. This is Willow Road in Hampstead. Open now uh, by the National Trust, designed um, by Erno Goldfinger. Um, and this was being built in Hampstead, this, this revolutionary modernist building in the middle of suburban London. When Ben Nicholson was back in London, when he was with a new partner, Barbara Hepworth, uh, living just around the corner, um, along the road from Henry Moore. Um, Hampstead, Hampstead. So we have, to, we have to move away from Cornwall to Hampstead. And 
what's happening at this time in Europe, of course, is that you have a huge exodus of artists and intellectuals from Germany and Central Europe because of the, uh, you know, the legislation the Nazis are bringing in. So you have, uh, you have Jewish academics um, in the, you know, after Hitler came in, 1933, succession of anti-Semitic laws. Jewish academics forced out of their posts. Jewish artists prevented from exhibiting, um, not allowed to sell their work anywhere. And if they can, if they can, people get away and they go west and a lot of them end up in London. And this is, this is the point at which, as never before, London becomes a centre of international modern art. It never had been that before. British art had always been trailing in the wake of Paris or Moscow. Um, but all these emigres to London make it a very different place. You've got people coming when the Bauhaus is, is disbanded. You've got people like uh, Marcel Breuer, the designer, coming to London. Again, living in Hampstead, just down the road from Barbara Hepworth here. And Ben Nicholson in the background taking her photo. Um, two, they were, they were, so Nicholson had left Winifred and he'd met this, this beautiful ambitious uh, young sculptor, Barbara Hepworth, uh, and they were living in London together as part of, this, part of this kind of coterie of real progressive international modern artists. Um, they were, uh, if you saw the Barbara Hepworth show at Tate Britain um, a couple of years ago, there was a whole room beautiful, beautifully displayed, I thought, of photos that they had taken of each other and their, and their work and their studios in the 30s. And they were very well aware. I mean, if they'd been around now, it would, they would have been Instagramming like mad, you know. They were very well aware of the power of the image and the self-image. So isn't this lovely? This is Hepworth kind of gazing at herself, but gazing at us too, because she knows that Ben is behind her, photographing her, but he's, you know, he's also in the picture, but there's their work in the background as well. I mean, it's very, very carefully orchestrated, this image. And here's another very carefully orchestrated image. This is um, Ben Nicholson, photographed by Humphrey Spender, Stephen Spender's brother. So again, you've got, you've got you know, a lot of connections with, with the other kind of cultural um, you know, things that are going on in British culture at that time. Uh, and another, they loved mirrors, didn't they? Look, here he is. And you can see, you can see the sort of, this is not, this is not the kind of um, Christopher Wood style, Alfred Wallace style, Winifred Nicholson style, modern art, um, fresh, joyful, colourful. This is abstract art. They've been over to Paris, they've met Mondrian, they've met Brancusi, they're very interested in what's happening there. This is the big moment for abstract art. Abstract art, which they firmly believed was going to help to save the world. It was going to help people to look at life differently and think differently and for, form ideas differently. It was, it was very much, all these artists were very much involved in the, in the anti-fascist cause. Uh, you know, they went on demonstrations, they donated work um, to, to help refugees and so on. They they've, were very much part of the political moment too, and none more so than this man, Naum Gabo. So, to introduce Gabo, he had started off uh, as, as a young poet in, in re revolutionary Russia. So we, we're celebrating, remembering the 1917 revolution this year. Well, Gabo was there and he was part of that astonishing moment in the early days of Soviet or of communist government in, in Russia after the revolution when artists were drawn, drawn in to, to, the, to the heart of, of really of, of government and new thinking and went out with their, you know, their, their new images, their abstract posters, their, their new designs. This was the, the new world that they were going to communicate to people through these images. So you had, um, you had kind of big billboards being towed through the streets in Moscow with, with kind of big abstract designs on them. You know, this was announcing to people that everything had changed. You weren't going to have tired old bourgeois representational painting anymore. You were going to have, you, you were going to have this, this new world which was full of exciting, strong color and abstract shapes. And Gabo, Gabo was part of that moment. And he really was, I think, in that little group in London, I think he was, he was one of the real big thinkers. 
Uh, and Gabo says somewhere, he wrote very well, he spoke very well about art. He, he, says, he says somewhere about how you know, works of art, objects, can, uh, they can be destroyed, they can be altered, but, but ideas, ideas are indestructible. Uh, and Gabo believed that his, his work existed as ideas, and he had a suitcase which he carried everywhere with him. It went everywhere with him on all his travels from Moscow to Berlin to London in the 30s, and then after the Second World War, off to America. He had a little suitcase which was full of miniature models of all his sculptures, so that wherever he went, all his ideas came with him. And here he is working on, uh, or holding at any rate, uh, one of those little models that he made out of, out of paper, out of cardboard. But then when, when plastics started to become commercially available, he started working in plastics, in acetate and in perspex. Uh, and I think he's, he's a great example of how artists, you get a new material commercially on the market, and artists are very often among the first to take that material and really show what it can do. And thinking of Perspex, I mean, it had just come on the market in the mid-30s. And within a, a year or two, Gabo had produced, I think, some of the most, most beautiful plastic objects ever made. You know, he didn't, he didn't have to wait for it to be developed and tested and so on. He, was, he could see the potential of this material straight away. And Gabo it was a fantastic improviser. This is a, uh, the Tate have half of, uh, the, the Gabo family have given half of his estate, his works and his drawings to, to the Tate. And they have a, a wonderful collection of these tiny little models, which are all decaying like mad, because, of course, these plastics are quite unstable. Um, and he would make them, he would bend this stuff in the oven, you know, and, and, and just see what he could do with it. This is nylon monofilament, which again was very, very new material in the 30s. And this is a lovely example of a, of a, a great big Gabo idea made in, in rather uh, fragile material, but it doesn't spoil the, the scale. And I think the audacity of that idea in, um, you know, we're thinking... 1937, 38, something like that. But you can see how that group were all influencing each other. So this is Ben Nicholson in 1937, about the same time Gabo made that little model. And here's Barbara Hepworth a few years later doing these, these abstract geometric drawings. So this is very much a kind of abstract geometric moment. And it, it is very much part of, of, the, of that 1930s uh, I, idealism and belief that art could, could help to change people's minds, could help stem the tide of fascism. This is just before the Second World War. And um, Gabo writes, just as war is about to break, he says, well, we're in for a rough ride now. You know, the ship is entering a storm. But what is really happening is, is all this is falling around our ears because we're just entering a period of great reconstruction. He, he had this terrific optimism. And if you think forwards, if you think forwards to the post-war period, of course, a lot of these ideas, I mean, you know, modern tower blocks, um, engineering, uh, uh, you know, domestic appliances, you can see these, you, you can see these ideas. <coughs> In, in the world that came to pass. So, so Gabo and, and his associates were right, really. These ideas outlasted the war. Well, here's, here's Gabo with his dog, Ben Nicholson with a large piece of seaweed, and here they are in Cornwall in the 40s. And this is, okay, we've had the Alfred Wallace moment, we had the Julius Olsen moment, the Bernard Leach moment. Well, here they are down from, they, had, they left London in 1939, because everyone thought London was going to be bombed as soon as war broke out. And Nicholson had a studio with a lot of glass in the roof. He had three small children. Uh, they thought, we must, we must go somewhere safer. Um, Nicholson and Barbara Hepworth and their three small children came down to stay with a friend in Cornwall. War broke out that week. They decided to stay. They persuaded Gabo to come with them. And it was really pictures like this. Here they are on the beach at Carbis Bay. And it was really pictures like this when I first saw them. Uh, I think at, there was a, a huge St. Ives exhibition at, at Tate Gallery in 1985, a long, long time ago. But I do remember that. I remember seeing 
pictures of Gabo with his trousers rolled up in the sand and thinking, this is astonishing. You know, this is one of the, one of the great thinkers and, and originators in, in modern art in anyone's terms, okay? You can, you can, all right, we've got Picasso, we've got Matisse, um, but, but, but in, in, terms of, in terms of thinking about the new shape of things uh, and what you could do with materials, I think Gabo is one of the great originators um, all the way from Moscow and, and, and from that, that moment of the Russian Revolution. And, and here he is, he is having some more ideas on the sand in Carbis Bay. And it, I thought that there's something quite astonishing about this, about this kind of, you know, how far from, how far from Moscow can you get? How far from, you know, Lenin and Lunacharsky and, and, uh, uh, and all that, you know. But, but he hasn't changed. He's still having these ideas. And I thought there's, there's something about that moment in Cornwall during the 1940s when these artists came down from London uh, and... and you know, decided, okay, they'd sit out the war there. That, that, was, a, that was quite, quite unique. Well, Barbara Hepworth, Ben Nicholson, Gabo, they spent the war years in St. Ives. Um, I will move on quite quickly now because we have to meet some more artists. A whole new generation. So that these were all people who'd been born in the, in the 1890s, you know, towards the end of the 19th century. The whole new generation of artists came down after the war. These are young men who've been through the war, women too, um, who have spent six years. I mean, imagine you're, you're 19, you're 20, you want to go to art school, you want to start your life, and you have to spend six years fighting or, or doing menial work as a conscientious objector or, or whatever it is. Six years is a long time, isn't it? You think the time between 20 and 26 or 22 and 28, it's a big chunk of your life at that age and they are all desperate after the war to get on. And some of them, because these modern artists, Nicholson, Hepworth, had come down to St. Ives, decided, well, that was where they would head. So I will introduce you to this crew. Um, there's, or some of them, well, there's Peter Lanyon up the ladder. Um, I think almost certainly Brian Winter taking the photograph and Sven Berlin and John Wells. And that's an exhibition they put in, on Instant Ives in 1946 of work that they had done over the past 10 years, really, um, trying to get going, stop, start, whatever they could manage while the war was on, trying to... to to get started as artists, as modern artists, progressive artists. So here's Peter Lanyon with, uh, with a painting that he produced, or an early version of the painting he produced for the Festival of Britain. He was the only one who was actually born in Cornwall. And here's, here's one of his coming back out of the RAF. Uh, here's where he got started. And you can see, if we just flick back to, to Hepworth, to Gabo. He had met Gabo, he had lent Gabo his studio while he was away in the RAF in St. Ives. He had been taught by Nicholson, and you can see those abstract ideas kind of yeasting away in there, but at the same time, he's, he's absolutely sort of determined to, to stake a claim as a Cornishman and, and make this a, a Cornish landscape, quite a mystical Cornish landscape. There's some kind of generative theme going on in there, and indeed this is the time when, when Lanyon and his wife started having their family of six children. So, you know, again, this is another thing people wanted to do straight after the war, was, was produce children, lots of children. Brian Winter. Now, Brian Winter, came, Brian Winter came from Oxford. He'd spent the war, I mean, he was, a, he was a, a London boy, but he'd spent the war, first of all, at the Slade School, which relocated to Oxford, and then as a conscientious objector uh, just up the road from here and the Life Sciences Building, I think, looking after monkeys that were destined to be blown up in explosives experiments uh, or injected with hormones. Um, and that was, you know, that was what he had to do. He couldn't wait. Uh, there's a letter where he describes, uh, after the war ends, there's a big effigy of Hitler that's burned on a big bonfire in St. Giles. And he describes this and he says, you know, and, and tomorrow I'm going to get on my motorbike and go to Cornwall. And that's what he did. Um, and Winter had had Jungian psychotherapy while he was in Oxford and was very, very interested in the, the unconscious um, and here he is, I think, uh, confronting his unconscious, perhaps for the first time in Cornwall. Um, 
in a, in a hovel up on the moors that he found. So this is a very, very different artistic journey from, from any of the others we've met so far. Here's, here's Brian Winter's hovel, and here's him describing the landscape he finds. So he's, he's, you know, he's been spending time in Oxford, and it, now he's somewhere like this. Again, could hardly be more different. And he describes, you know, he's, you can see how everyone is seeing where I started off, really. They're seeing this same place differently through different eyes, coming from a different place. And he says, looking at these rocks, it's, uh, you know, it would be odd living up there among these rocks, rather like owning a large private collection of Henry Moores. So to him, they're not just big stones, they're pieces of modern sculpture. And there's a, I, I couldn't get an image of the painting that you've got out in the corridor here, but this is from a very similar time, very similar landscape. Um, this is the mining country round St. Ives, but seen, I think, through the lens of German expressionist cinema. Uh, Brian Winter loved films like uh, the Fritz Lang films, Cabinet of Dr. Cagliari, Metropolis, that kind of thing, and it's very much that kind of lighting in here. So again, I look at this and I think, okay, that's a very, that's a very local <coughs> landscape. But at the same time, there are many connections with, uh, you know, with events and cultural, cultural strands far, far away. Uh, again, I think there's, there's a lot, of, there's, there's a lot of, of Jungian archetype in that as well, as though, as though the landscape were connecting winter to something deep, deep in the human psyche and human history. Here's another one of the, the post-war crowd. This is Terry Frost. Uh, Terry Frost, another one who went on to have six children. Uh, they got going pretty quickly as soon as, as, soon as they got out of, you know, of, of, the, war, uh, of the war. Uh, and here's Frost with, with one of his sons. Um, very much, I think, very much the kind of um, the, the, the new, uh, you know, the, the, the new welfare state sort of dad. Uh, very much a, an image of that moment by uh, the photographer Roger Main. And Frost, Frost again, a, a different journey. He'd spent the war, he'd grown up in the working class West Midlands. He'd spent the war as a prisoner of war in Germany, uh, seen some, some very traumatic things, but as part of staying sane in the prison camp, he had started painting. And he realised when he got... So there was no, you know, there, there, there was... He, no one, no one in his family had ever mentioned art before. Um, and he was worried uh, when he, he went back to stay with his grandmother in uh, Leamington Spa, and he wore, uh, he'd become an artist, so he wore a beret and sandals, and he'd grown a big beard. And she insisted on walking on the other side of the road from him. She wouldn't be seen with him, you know. And so that was, that was what art meant, where, where he came from. Um, but he came, he came down, you know, tipped off by someone he'd been in prisoner war camp, came down to St. Ives, went on with the painting because that was somewhere where you could learn, you could learn from other artists, you know, he would make a go of it down there. And here's one of his early sketchbooks, and you can see it's really fascinating, these books, you can see him trying out, trying out modern abstract art and then going to the life class, and you have to tip it up that way. You can see that's a life model with um, a foot on top of a, a chair. So he's, he's trying to learn from any, anything that comes his way there. But this is his, his great breakthrough abstract painting, Walk Along the Quay. And this is to do with the quayside, okay, in the Alfred Wallace painting, we've seen it, the quayside at St. Ives, the harbour at St. Ives, but seen through the lens of a, of a modern abstract artist and also a young father because the reason he was walking around the harbour was that he had to get up very early in the morning to push his, his youngest child because they were waking the neighbours up. So there he was, out there with the pushchair, looking at the harbour, pushchair bouncing along the stones. And all of that experience, which is, which is very much to do with that moment in his life, all these things coming together, is in this abstract painting. And you, you know, I could just, I could spend 40 minutes unpacking this painting, but the point I'm making really is you think, all right, this is abstract shapes, this is sort of half moons and rectangles and things like that, but actually it, it's, full, it's full of human experience. There's a whole life story in there. Wilhelmina Barnes-Graham, another artist, you can see a couple of her works out there in the, 
in the display at the end of the corridor. She'd come from Edinburgh School of Art. Uh, so she was, a, she was a very privileged young girl. Um, she had, uh, you know, there was family money, there was family support for her art. Uh, she was going to go off to Paris when the war, on a scholarship when the war started, and obviously you couldn't then travel to the continent. So again, through, through sort of friendship group and connections, she decided to come to St. Ives. And here she is in one of the Porthmere studios. We've seen Julius Olsen in there. We'll see other artists in there. Now, this is a, this is a painting she did rather, you know, a few years later, end of the 40s, where she did a trip to Switzerland. And this is all about uh, the Grindelwald Glacier. But you can see there, look at that shape at the top. That's pure Gabo. And she spent a lot of time talking to Gabo and being influenced by his ideas and always acknowledged that. You know, she said he, he always said he was really important for her. Um, and tells some of the nicest stories about Gabo. Um, she remembered going to see his, uh, his little daughter, Miriam, in her pram. Uh, lots of children in this story. Uh, and all Gabo had painted, he was in a bungalow in Carbis Bay, which he, he was renting, and he painted all the walls white, as people did, you know. And everything was white, white, white. And then there was this little baby in a, in a white pram. And Gabo pointed to the girl and said, you know, ah, that's, that's the greatest work of art I have ever made, you know. So uh, Wil Wilhelmina Barnes Graham, uh, you know, so she was, he was very important in her life. But I... You can see Gabo's influence here, but you can also see that what he has taught her to see, which is to look into the heart of this glacier and into the way that light is refracted. And, and so he has opened her eyes. So you get a sense of the, the kind of the, the passing on uh, that's happening here. And here's, I, I tried again to find one that is similar as possible to the one that's out in, in, the, in this display there. This is one that, Wilhelmina Barnes Graham made much later in life, and it, I think it's called Kites at St. Ives or something like that. And this is to do with looking out of her studio window on Porthmere Beach and, and, the, and the shapes of kites and things like that that children are flying in the air. i am introduce you to a, another artist here. This is Patrick Heron. Um, we've seen some of his teenage work in the Silk Square. He came down, uh, he was again a London-based artist, spent a lot of time in Paris. Um, he is a very, very much influenced by Bonnard, by, by French colorists. Uh, he came down to St. Ives regularly because he'd been there as a child. Um, but also, um, I mean, you can, you can see here, he's, he's, this, is, this is very much, you know, in the spirit of Bonnard. But here he is carrying that same sense of colour and light and so on into, into the environment in St. Ives, where he's spending a lot of, you know, spending the summer every year after the war and deciding to move down in 1956, finding this, you've seen Brian Winter's hovel. Well, this, this extraordinary house and garden is just about a couple of hundred yards down the slope towards the sea, very close to each other, very different environments. A house called Eagle's Nest, where... Heron immediately began to paint these paintings, which are full of the colour of that azalea garden, but also very much to do with, with French Tachiste painting, artists like de Stael and Soulage. Uh, very much that, that moment, that renewal of abstract art, gestural abstract art in the, in the mid-1950s. So passing on, gosh, I must... I'm, I want to give you some time for questions. Here's, here's, a, here's an idea of, of how ideas were shared, how ideas were shared in St. Ives. This is Brian Winter, the poet Sidney Graham. Um, this, is, this is, they have been up all night, okay? This photograph was taken about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, Karl Veschke, German prisoner of war. Again, another story I haven't got time to go into this evening um, of, on the far right side. And I gave a talk uh, earlier this summer where someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know that person who's got his head in his hands, that was me. Um, a young student at an art school that was running in St. Ives at the time. Anyway, here they are, um, early, late night talk at the Khan. And what they've been doing all night is exchanging poetry. Graham was a poet and Winter knew lots and lots of poems off by heart. And they would have these kind of poetry competitions. Uh, and of, you can sort of see who's winning at this point. 
This is Brian Winter again, and I'm just going to introduce this a whole new phase opens in these artists' lives in the, in the mid-1950s when, you know, thinking back to those, those histories of the 50s, never had it so good. Macmillan, it's 57, isn't it? It's when the British economy finally picks up. It's when people have money to spend again. <coughs> when, when we become aware of America, uh, American paintings shown in London, in 1956, American abstract expressionist paintings, Pollock, Rothko, de Kooning, um, all those artists making, making a big impact in London from about that time, and artists in St. Ives becoming aware of it. But at the same time, so there's this kind of ex new explorations of painting, but there's exploration of the landscape. Winter was also obsessed with the films of Jacques Cousteau and constructed his own aqualung out of army surplus kit he'd picked up and wanted to see what it, you know, lots of artists paint the sea from on top, but he wanted to see what it looked like underneath. So things were coming together for him. The exploration of the landscape, the experience of modern American abstract expressionist art, uh, and also using mescaline, uh, which he did experimentally rather than recreationally. I'm absolutely sure that was the case. Uh, and this is the first painting that really came out of all those experiences coming together. Again, it's a painting I could probably unpack for you, the human story. We could spend another 40 minutes happily talking about that. But the point here is, again, there are these, these long-distance connections. You know, you've got what's going on in New York is having a big effect on what Winter's doing. Um, developments in aqualung technology, all these things. Um, and, you know, drug use, which again is, is, is part of the culture. I mean, Win Winter and his artistic associates were onto it in the mid-1950s. We tend to think of that whole countercultural moment being a 1960s thing, but that's quite wrong. You know, people were experimenting with, with, with psychedelic drugs much earlier than that, and they were having a kind of, a kind of cultural effect. And Winter moved on to do kinetic work. So I'm saying here with these images, really, that these artists are not standing still. They're, they're moving with the times. They're working in areas that other contemporary artists are working in. Um, what does happen now is that the real centre of gravity shifts towards London art schools, the art market, the American art market, dealers in London like Kasmin, who are keyed in to the American market, the international market. And this leaves artists in St. Hives very much out on a ledge. But this does not happen until really the early 1960s. So at the time when Winter was painting this, really artists in St. Hives who decided to work there were, were just as far ahead of the game as anyone else in this country. Terry Frost in his Portmere studio around 1960, um, and you can see how his work has changed. We've got certainly the influence of American abstract art in this, the way that the paint is much thinner. You can feel the, 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 the kind of gestural movement, the full arm brushwork in that. Uh, but also still, I think, the atmosphere of the place coming into it. This is called Force 8, so it, it's talking about what it feels like to be in this space with the wind pushing at the windows. Peter Lanyon, uh, this is him working in another studio in St. Ives on a big mural commission he got from an American collector called Stanley Seeger. So this, this painting went out to the States. Um, uh, Lanyon was exhibiting in New York at the time with Catherine Viviano, regular shows there. So there's a real, uh, there's a real to and fro between St. Ives and New York at this time. An, a Lanyon painting uh, from about this time late in his career called Mexico, because he spent some time out in the States and, in fact, was even thinking of moving there. Roger Hilton, OK, I must, I must move on. Uh, this, I think, is the, the, last, the last of the artists I'll introduce you to. Hilton, who, like Frost, had spent the war in a prisoner of war camp, even worse, even worse experience he had on a death march and so on. So the kind of baggage these people are coming back with in the 40s and the 50s is, is something it's almost hard to imagine now um, in our country as, as we are now, not elsewhere in the world, obviously. Hilton, very much uh, in tune with the Cobra artists in um, Northern Europe, in Amsterdam. Um, 
early in his career. You can see when he started coming down painting regularly in Cornwall, how, how his figure paintings become really inflected with the colours of the landscape. He made the big mistake in 1965 of actually moving to Cornwall. And this is a little glimpse of what happened. This is the poet Sidney Graham at the top. I think there are bottles of whiskey in... It's like one of those things you have to prove you're not a robot, you know. Um, how, many, how many pictures have got street signs in them? Well, how many pictures here have got bottles of whiskey in them? Um, I, anyway, it was... Hilton, Hilton had shown at the Venice Biennale the year or two before this. He was really... He was really kind of riding the wave and he decided to move to Cornwall with his new wife and his new young family. And it was not good news for him because he, he, he started drinking very heavily. He spent a lot of time with Sidney Graham, who was also drinking very heavily but could take it. Um, and Hilton became very, very ill. And so here we have, here we have the whole progress of a career, really, uh, a, whole, a whole life in these three paintings. He became so ill that he could hardly hold a brush. He couldn't hold a brush in his right hand, was confined to bed and produced this uh, wonderful series of, of hundreds of gouache, of, of, of it, you can, you know, erotic fantasy and, and sort of storybook figures of animals and boats and things like that. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's, the end, that's the end of a long, long story, which ends in, in, a, in a very seedy sickbed in this little cottage, again, far, far west at Vitalik, which is almost, you almost drop into the seeds, west even of St. Ives. Sandra Blow, so, sorry, I'll be quick now. Sandra Blow, um, women artists in St. Ives, I think... I think this book of mine was the first, really, to give a, a whole chapter, and indeed we should have a whole book of, of the women artists who came down to St. Ives, who worked there, for whom it was an important place for her work. Um, Sandra Blow here, friend of Roger Hilton, came down to stay with Patrick Heron, started, stayed for a year, um, brought this way of making work, that's textile there, stuck to the canvas, there's plaster rubbed into it. She had had a, an affair with an Italian artist called Alberto Burri. So what she's bringing here into, into her time in Cornwall is, is modern contemporary Italian art. One of the... You, you might not see it from this. This has just been on display at Tate Britain. I think one of the absolute knockout paintings of, of the second half of the 20th century in Britain, Sandra Blow's Green and White. It's a 10-foot square painting. Uh, terrific work. I'm just really showing you, I suppose, what, you know, how, how good these artists are and how, how their work really does. I mean, you know, when we come to write the history of British art in the last 100 years, I, I, think that's, I think that's one of the most terrific paintings that's been done. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a tendency to think, oh, these artists who came down to Cornwall, they were kind of getting out of the swim, they were off to the side, but that's not the case at all. I think, you know, Sandra Blow is, is one of the stories, one of the, one of the lives that tells that story. Alexander Mackenzie, um, there's, again, work of his that you can see out there, um, went through the war in a tank regiment, and I think that's partly why a lot of his landscapes are this long sort of slot shape, because he spent a lot of time staring out of the... And, and you imagine, you're, 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 again, very young. You know, he was 18 or 19 in this armoured car, in fact, going through the Teutoburger Wald at the end of the war with some of the most ferocious fighting as the Germans were forced... German army was forced back through Europe. And you imagine rolling towards woodland, uh, looking through this slot, not knowing what was going to... You know, we look at a landscape and we know the landscape's not going to fire shells at us, but that wasn't the case for him. So, and I think, I think a lot of the tension in his, in his sense of landscape comes out of that experience. That's my theory, anyway. A lot of his paintings are this shape. Um, these are both Cornish landscapes. He's learnt a lot from Ben Nicholson, rubbing, rubbing down, applying the paint, rubbing it down again. Um, I'm just going to have to pass through these, really, to this point. A few pictures to show the international connections. So this is St Ives in 1959. Terry Frost, Patrick Heron. The man on the right is Clement Greenberg, the, the, the czar of abstract expressionism. The, the art critic who could tell Jackson Pollock how to paint. 
Uh, he was a very, very powerful figure in the New York art world. And here he is, uh, just on the street outside Terry Frost's studio. I, I know exactly where this spot is. I go past it most days. Um, and, uh, at, you know, so that's a point of connection. There's Mark Rothko having tea with Peter Lanyon um, in Paul Filer's studio. Uh, I would love to say that's a Cornish cream tea, but I'm not actually, I can't get close enough into the photo to be sure whether they're eating scones. But they're enjoying a very Cornish kind of experience. Mark and Mel Rothko, again, you know, Mark Rothko, um, one, of, one of the giants of, of the New York school. In Cornwall in 1959, Peter Lanyon tried to persuade him to buy a Methodist chapel as a studio. And, you know, what would have happened if Rothko had said, yeah, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll stop here and work for a few years now. St. Ives again, 1960, big fashion moment. Uh, it becomes a, a glamorous place. Um, here's Honey magazine photographing Barbara Hepworth in the courtyard of her studio. Here's Barbara Hepworth uh, outside the United Nations in New York. There's a single form unveiled there in 1964. You couldn't get really more international or more high profile than that. Um, and here are very similar sculptures, similar sort of time. Barbara Hepworth's garden, studio garden in St. Ives. And I'm going to finish on this image because I think this, this says a lot, really, about why I still think this is, you know, an important story to tell. St. Ives is, I think, probably the only place in the world where a, a, a woman artist has has been at the top of the pile. Barbara Hepworth, by this time, acknowledged as the, as, as the leading artist in, uh, in St. Ives. Um, the leading artist, I mean, always, you know, slightly in the sense of playing second fiddle to Henry Moore, but certainly one of the, one of the leading modern artists in this country. Um, I can't think of any other places where the, the art pyramid has worked that way. Um, normally, normally, you know, there are a few blokes at the top. Um, but not in St. Ives. I think that's, you know, that's another remarkable part of the story. I was going to finish with a little reading um, where I, uh, I became quite obsessed by 1950s sort of home management type books and, and the, way that they, uh, the way that they cast gender roles. And there are some very, very interesting... Um, but I, it, I pick out one quote from... Um, Patrick Heron's obituary of Ben Nicholson, and you think, again, Ben Nicholson, a lot of these abstract shapes with sort of holes in the middle. Nicholson, Barbara Hepworth's husband. And uh, Patrick Heron says in the obituary to Nicholson, you know, there is not, a, and you think of the cooker hob with the, the circles on it, and he says, you know, there's not a single cooker anywhere in the world that does not owe something to Ben Nicholson. And I think he's kind of overstating the case there, but I don't think he's entirely wrong, because I think this, I think this abstract vision and this sense in which domestic life, the whole of life, the way we live, the ordinary daily things we do, can be can be shaped and touched and sort of purified and energised by art is very much what, what Barbara Hepworth's about here. And I think, you know, I, I think there is some truth in that. Uh, I, so I, I end with this image and um, I hope we have some time for questions, but thank you all very much for listening to us. <laughs> Lizzie, did, have we got a moment? Yes, if anyone's got any questions, um, I think now is the time, uh, after which I think there'll be a short reception outside. So, um, and some books. And, and some books, as I was going to mention. The books, it's an Ives artist. Michael's book we have for sale at a discount price tonight. If anyone's interested, it's £25 as opposed to £30. And it can be signed by Michael. So... Um, and lots of these wonderful images are in your book as well, aren't they? Um, so yes, not all of them. Not but all of them, I mean, but a lot of them are. Yes, so yeah. um, it's a great opportunity yeah. to, have, to, to get that as well. But any sure. questions now? Is it true that Rothko was looking for a chapel yes. to house his mystical uh, Well, Peter Lanyon tried to persuade him to buy one. There was one, a chapel in the Lant that he took him to see. Right. Um, and they're having, they must be talking about it at the tea party because they went on from there. To, to have tea. And ov obviously Rothko did end up uh, 
you know, working in, the, in, a, in a chapel, but it was in, in Houston and not in St. Ives. <laughs> so it's one of those, you know, those what-if moments. Um, I'm not sure how close they came to, to sealing the deal, um, but Lanyon was certainly trying. Can I ask a simplistic question? Um, you're putting forward the notion that they came to St. Ives coincidentally to begin with, and then more people joined them. I think that's part of it, yes. At, at the very beginning, uh, the light in Cornwall is always mentioned. I, I think I, I've told a big story in, you know, an hour, um, and I'm conscious of leaving out lots of things, but I think there are two very different moments. I think there's the, the Julius Olson with his hammock and his big window looking over the sea. He's part of the, the, the sort of Victorian gentleman artists who came down because they found in Cornwall something that they had also found in Brittany, and, you know, on, on the coast on the, the in the Netherlands and so on, these little fishing communities where they lived among the locals and they painted the landscape. Um, people always mention the light in Cornwall and, and the light is obviously for any artist, for any visually aware, visually alive person, the light is, is that sea light. You get the light on both sides. You know, it, it's, it's very, very striking. <coughs> but I think for many artists, I've mentioned tonight, the light was not the big thing. Um, the artist Brian O'Casey, who I haven't talked about tonight, said um, he came down in the 50s and he said, you know, people say that St. Ives is all about the light. He said, that's balls. It's about camaraderie. It's about having other artists to, you know, other crazy people to, to, to support you and to work with. And so I think that's the bigger part of the story. But then if you listen to Patrick Heron, who, of course, as I said, loved Bonnard, loved Matisse. When he writes about Cornwall, he writes about it as though it's a kind of Provence, as though it's, as though it's the country of Matisse, you know, a Celtic Provence, where the, the quality of the light and the colour is, is important. When Brian Winter writes about it, it's because it's a landscape, you know, full of holes and darkness and ruins, and it's, it's like entering your own unconscious. So they see the same landscape in different ways, I think is what I'm saying. So the light is part of the story, um, but certainly not all of it, and certainly not a big part of it for lots of these artists. Karl Veschke, who I've mentioned, um, painted with the curtains closed and a single electric light bulb on, and that was how he worked. And, you know, he could have opened the curtains and looked out at the western horizon beyond Cape Cornwall, but he didn't like to do that. So... Well, thank you so much, Michael. Well, I, I think it's been so that. informative. I've, I, for one, have certainly learnt a lot tonight. It was wonderful to see this ticket because um, he's usually so dark. Yes, yes. And um, really, that was that was an amazing. Well, um, that's well. Work. I think that's yeah. maybe almost. I mean, he did the theatre paintings, which yeah. are kind of red and, and sort of garish. But I think yeah. that's I think that's one Beautiful of very very work. few yeah. um, paintings yeah. where you see that quality of the light. Absolutely, and I'm a great fan of abstract art and how abstract art can still change the world. So I think that. That's kind of what we've done with the hang here at um, the Said Business School. And um, I would, I, I mean, I've just been in the Ashmolean this yeah. morning and I would also say, you know, take a look at what's there, but also the, the modern British art room. Absolutely. There, they have some very nice Nicholsons, yeah. they have he Hepworths, uh, and um, a, quite, you know, quite a few of the artists I've been talking about tonight you will find in, in that little room. Fantastic. Well, let's continue the conversation. We can continue. And thank uh, you so yes. much. Well, no, okay. thank you for organising no, no, this. Thank you for and thank coming. You. Thank you.